Hello YouTubers and welcome to JK Lenses review of Nikon's Holy Trinity of f2.8 AFS zoom lenses. Between them these three AFS lenses are designed to cover the focal length range right from 14mm ultra wide all the way up to long telephoto at 200mm. In other words, all the focal length range that most photographers are ever likely to need. These three lenses are the 14-24 f2.8 wide angle zoom, the 24-70 f2.8 standard zoom and the 70-200 f2.8 telephoto zoom. In the third of these three videos we take a look at the 70-200 f2.8 telephoto zoom lens. As usual this review is in four sections. Firstly we run down the specification list for this lens and then have a look at its handling in everyday use. We check out its optical performance and then see how well it compares against some of the possible alternatives which are available. Firstly, before this video goes any further, I need to explain why my Nikon 70-200 f2.8 is light grey rather than the usual black. It's a light to mid grey finish which Nikon called tropical grey, although it sometimes appears closer to white in some shots in this video. Although it looks similar to the lighter coloured lens bodies produced by some other manufacturers, which are designed to keep the insides of the lens cool when working in very hot conditions, the Nikon Tropical Grey finish is a purely cosmetic variation, and the insides of the 70-200 f2.8 being reviewed here are exactly the same as all the black ones that have been produced. Nikon went through a phase of producing some of their professional lenses in this finish, but it's now no longer available, although you do see the odd one or two popping up occasionally on the second-hand market. In common with the other two lenses in Nikon's Holy Trinity, this lens maintains a constant f2.8 aperture right across its zoom range from 70 to 200 mm It's also internally focusing and internally zooming across the whole of this range. Achieving these impressive specifications makes it one of Nikon's most complicated lenses, with 21 pieces of glass in 15 groups, and no less than 5 of them being made of Nikon's extra low dispersion or ED glass. It's an AFS lens being focused by Nikon's silent wave motors inside the lens, and in common with many other Nikon professional lenses, it takes 77 mm filters. The lens is also designated a G lens, which means it has no aperture ring, and therefore requires a camera body which is capable of setting the aperture itself electronically. The lens also has Nikon's vibration reduction or VR system. The one being reviewed here is a VR1 version, as shown by the red logo. Since 2009 there's been an updated version of this lens available, which has the VR2 system, and carries a gold VR logo. This lens has an angle of view which varies from 34 degrees at the 70mm end down to just 12 degrees at the 200mm end. In other words, it's designed for subjects which present a fairly small angle of view to the camera. And as those of you who've watched the famous Father Ted sketch will know, this means objects which are either very small or very far away, or some combination of the two. To help us visualise this focal length range, here's the spectacular chapel of King's College Cambridge. Due to the limited space in front of the chapel, this view has been squeezed in using a 24mm lens. A 50mm lens shows just part of the roof and the two towers above the great window. The 70-200 lens zoomed out to 70mm shows a fairly similar view to the standard lens. Following the focal lens marked on the lens itself, our next stop is 80mm, where we start to get a bit more of a close-up view of the tops of the towers, with 105mm continuing this effect. At the classic telephoto focal length of 135mm, we really start to get a close-up view of the top of the nearest tower, and can start to see the details of the 16th century carvings. And finally at 200mm we have a clear and detailed picture of the last few carvings on the very top of the tower. However, the 70-200 zoom lens isn't finished there. It can be used very effectively with any of Nikon's three sizes of AFS teleconverter. With the 1.4x teleconverter in place, this lens can zoom in even further to 280mm, giving detailed close-ups of the last few stones at the very top of the tower. This effect is continued with the 1.7x teleconverter which turns it into a 340mm lens, and with the 2 times teleconverter in place, this lens zooms all the way out to 400mm, where you really can see the smallest details on the topmost carvings. If you're into photographing lightning conductors, then this setup could be the perfect choice for you. Although these topmost carvings are over 100 feet away from the camera, the 70-200mm focal length can obviously be used to pull in objects much further away than this. To illustrate this, here's a shot of Brown Sea Island in Poole Harbour in Dorset, on the south coast of England. In the low-angled light of an early midwinter morning, this view forms a perfectly pleasant shot with a 50mm standard lens. However, with the 70-200mm lens, we can start to see details of Brown Sea Island itself and Brown Sea Castle, both of which are over 2km away. As before, the 70mm focal length gives a view which is only slightly zoomed in from the 50mm standard lens view. But as we zoom in past 80, 105 and 135mm, 
we start to see the details of the island and the castle much more clearly as they're pulled in by these focal lengths. And finally at 200mm we have a fairly close up view of the island, the castle and the boats in between. As before, we can also use the AFS teleconverters to take us through 280 and 340mm all the way to 400mm again, where we can take quite detailed pictures of these very distant objects. In complete contrast, this lens has a closest focus distance of about 1.5 metres. Combining this with the 200mm focal length gives this shot of my familiar garden ornament. Viewing an object this close too with such a long focal length produces a very thin depth of field and the object stands out quite clearly from its background, which is only a few feet behind it. As with any 70-200 f2.8 zoom, this lens is a large unit. It's slightly thicker than the substantial 24-70 f2.8 zoom lens at just under 9cm across. The lens itself is 21.5cm long, and when the lens hood is added, it's nearly 30cm long. Given its strong metal construction, it not surprisingly tips the scales at just under 1.5kg. Despite this, I've always found the lens comfortable to use, and when combined with one of the larger Nikon bodies, forms a well-balanced combination. Despite its large size, the fast f2.8 aperture and the addition of VR means that the lens works very effectively handheld, and quite a few of the photographs taken with this lens in this review were taken handheld. Nevertheless, this lens is getting into the upper reaches of what can be handheld comfortably, and for best results I generally use a monopod, where this lens handles very well. Starting our tour of the lens at the lens mount, the first thing we notice is the rubber ring which completes the lens's weather sealing. When combined with a similarly weather sealed body, this system works extremely well. In over 10 years of owning this lens, I've stood outside for many hours with it, in some absolutely shocking weather, and it's never faltered even once. Since this lens actually weighs slightly more than the Nikon D3S body, it moves the centre of gravity of the whole system to a point significantly in front of the camera body. For this reason, Nikon supplied the lens with its own tripod foot, attached to the lens by a metal ring part way along its length. Although it's not possible to remove this tripod collar, loosening a nut at the side allows you to rotate it fully. This means that when mounted on a tripod, the camera and lens can be rotated through any angle, which is obviously very useful when shooting in the vertical format. Rotating the tripod foot to the top of the lens means that it doesn't get in the way when hand holding, and it can also be used as a handy carrying handle for the camera and lens. If you want to remove the tripod foot from the lens entirely, this can be done by loosening the nut just above it and then holding in the button just above the foot. This allows the foot to be removed from the lens entirely. Moving forward from the tripod mount we come to the cartouche of switches which can be found on most Nikon telephoto lenses. These are the controls for the autofocus and vibration reduction systems. The top two switches control the autofocus system. The top switch switches between auto and manual focus. When in the M position on the right the focusing of the lens is entirely manual. When in the MA position on the left, the lens can be auto-focused by the camera body, but this can be immediately overridden by holding and turning the focus ring on the lens. The second switch allows you to limit the range of distances which the autofocus system will hunt through. In the full position on the left, the lens will hunt all the way from infinity right down to its closest focus distance of 1.5 meters. Even when searching this full range, the lens still delivers extremely speedy autofocus. Nevertheless, putting this switch to the right-hand position limits the focus to distances greater than 2.5 meters, and this allows the lens to deliver extremely fast autofocus. The lower two buttons on the lens control the vibration reduction system. The upper of the two simply switches the system on or off. On the VR1 model shown here, this means that you can shoot at shutter speeds three stops slower than normal hand holding speeds. On the later VR2 model of this lens, this is extended to four stops. Finally, the bottom button allows you to switch between normal and active VR. Normal VR works to remove the vibration from ordinary hand holding. Active VR removes the much larger movements produced by being on something like a moving car or a moving boat. The next section of the lens contains the zooming and focusing rings. They're both very well made with extremely hard wearing rubber grips. The first of these rings is the zooming ring which has a light but positive action. With a throw of only 90 degrees it can be used to take the lens from 70 all the way to 200 very quickly indeed. And as you can see, this is the only one of Nikon's holy trinity of f2.8 zoom lenses which is actually internally zooming. Rotating the zooming ring has no effect whatsoever on the length of the lens. In front of the zooming ring is the focusing ring with its very handy flared shape. It has a very light action and requires a turn of just over 90 degrees to take the lens all the way from its closest focus distance of 1.5 meters all the way to infinity. As with the other holy trinity zoom lenses, it's completely internally focusing. Just in front of the focus ring and at the 3, 6 and 9 o'clock positions around the lens, there are three buttons. 
These operators' autofocus lock buttons, pressing and holding any one of them, will lock the autofocus system on its current distance. In everyday use, they fall very easily to hand and are extremely useful. With most Nikon digital camera bodies, their action can be customised to a range of other functions. Passing the weather sealed focus scale, we reach the front of the lens which accepts 77mm filters. On the front of the lens fits the deep, petal-shaped lens hood. Ever since owning this lens, I've thought the hood to be made of rather thin plastic and to have a rather flimsy bayonet catch. However, this lens is now in its 12th year of use with me and the hood continues to work perfectly, so I guess I have to eat my own words on this one. The three sizes of AFS teleconverter that work with this lens have a progressively adverse effect on the balance of the camera and lens system. While it's possible after a while to forget that you've got the 1.4 teleconverter fitted to the lens, the 2 times teleconverter throws the system significantly out of balance and makes the whole system very hard work for hand-holding, particularly at 400mm. Nevertheless, given the right subjects, the VR system comes to the rescue here and it's perfectly possible to get sharp pictures even at 400mm, albeit at the expense of aching arms. This lens was one of the first professional AFS lenses which I bought and at the time probably represented the single most expensive piece of camera equipment I'd ever bought. At the time I can remember swallowing hard before pressing enter on the credit card machine and all the way home wondering if I'd done the right thing. However, within hours of putting it on a camera body, it was clear that this is one of Nikon's best lenses ever. Almost immediately I was taking pictures noticeably better than those I'd taken before. Its optical quality is outstanding, making it something of an exceptional performer amongst zoom lenses. Standards of sharpness, resolution and saturation are all impeccable and the level of control over the usual distortions that affect telephoto zoom lenses is extremely high. Add to this the lens's superb ergonomics, its lightning fast and near silent autofocus, and its tank-like build quality, and you have a lens which represents outstanding value for money, despite its high price. Starting at 70mm, the lens provides a focal length which is only slightly narrower than that of a standard lens. Nevertheless, this can be used to give a slightly tighter perspective to landscape shots, or for fairly wide portraits. At this focal length, the f2.8 aperture can do a reasonable job of losing the background, but as in this shot, the best results come by keeping the background a fair distance away behind the subjects. As we move the focal length up to the classic portrait values around 85mm, the lens continues to do a good job of separating its subject from the background. However, if the background is complex and or close by, it starts to become clear why portrait prime lenses in this region offer even faster apertures such as f2 or f1.4. Nevertheless, if the background is uncomplicated and or far away, then this lens can do an excellent job as a portrait lens, and the fact that the lens can easily be zoomed up into the low hundreds gives it tremendous flexibility. As we pass classic telephoto focal lengths like 135mm, this lens's ability to separate subjects from their background becomes increasingly evident. With subjects like motorsport, I've often found that the very thin depth of field at f2.8 is actually too thin, often resulting in only the very front of the first car being in focus. Stopping down to f4 or f5 gives better results in these situations, allowing the whole of the first competitor to be in focus. As with all of the lenses in Nikon's Holy Trinity, performance wide open at f2.8 is excellent. In the case of the 70-200, there's only a very tiny improvement in optical quality to be had by stopping down to f4. The ability of this lens to produce excellent results when shooting close to wide open at fairly long focal lengths makes it useful for photographing things such as wildlife. However, the fact that it only zooms out to 200mm makes it best suited for animals which are relatively large and which you can get fairly close to. If you're photographing very tiny and or very wild animals, then you're probably going to want a focal length a bit more than 200mm. Although this lens can go all the way out to 400mm with the use of teleconverters, if your subjects force you to shoot around the 400mm focal length all the time, then you'll probably prefer a lens that can reach those focal lengths unaided. Although not an obvious choice for landscape photography, this lens's ability to isolate small items out of a larger scene mean that it can be used to produce some eye-catching results. The particular perspective gained by shooting from a long distance can favour many subjects, such as this elegant piece of 17th century Italianate architecture. One of my favourite properties of this lens is its ability to take you from being a spectator to feeling closely involved in the action. Particularly in areas such as motorsport, its fast aperture and long focal lengths allow you to focus in on the individual battles taking place within the race. And finally, the 70-200's longest focal lengths allow you to photograph things that you simply can't get very close to. Objects which are up in the sky or behind big fences can now be made to fill the frame. And once again, the particular perspective that comes from shooting from a long distance away can also enhance the appearance of many of these objects. Whether it's Formula One cars or top secret radio telescopes, the 70-200 can get you photographs which you simply couldn't take with a standard lens. And subjects which you might at first have thought were best taken with a standard lens can take on a whole new perspective with the 70 to 200. 
As someone who normally shoots quite fast moving things at a fairly high shutter speed, I've never been particularly bothered for Nikon's VR system. However, the VR system's ability to detect and enhance panning shots is a tremendous asset with these 70-200mm focal lengths. As someone who used to waste a lot of frames just to get one decent shot back in the day of film photography, I have to say that I'm a huge fan of this aspect of the 70-200's VR system. Using the traditional panning technique of turning the camera and lens to follow the subject as it goes past you, the clever little gyroscopes inside the lens detect this intentional movement and only correct for any unwanted up and down movement. As you can see, from someone who was never particularly good at this technique, the results speak for themselves. As mentioned previously, this lens can be used with any one of Nikon's three AFS teleconverters, preserving the AFS focusing and the vibration reduction system. As you can see, each of these units converts the lens to successively longer focal lengths, but at the cost of an increasing reduction to its maximum aperture. The smallest teleconverter, the 1.4 times, extends the lens out to just under 300mm, but at the cost of reducing the maximum aperture back to f4. In use, it has almost no effect on the speed of the lens's operation or its optical quality. Compared to the size and weight of a 300mm f4 lens, this is clearly a very handy item to tuck away in a corner of a camera bag. However, it could also be argued that its relatively mild effect on the image can easily be mimicked by cropping in the computer afterwards, a point worth bearing in mind as none of these teleconverters is particularly cheap. At the opposite end of the spectrum, the 2 times teleconverter doubles the maximum focal length to 400mm, but brings the maximum aperture down to f5.6. Although this is a very handy way of carrying the 400mm focal length around with you, it does slow down the speed of the autofocus operation, and there is a small but noticeable drop in optical quality. Of the three, the one7 times teleconverter seems to offer the best compromise, allowing the lens to zoom out to a substantial 340mm, with almost no discernible effect on speed or optical quality. One of the basic ideas behind the setting up of the JK lenses channel was the view that camera lenses are fundamentally more important than camera bodies in creating great images. Although that's an enormous debate for another time, the 70-200 f2.8 lens really does support that view very strongly. I've certainly used this lens on a very wide range of Nikon DSLR bodies and it produces superb images on every one. For example, although most of the images in this review were produced using a D3S with its 12.1 megapixel FX sensor, some of the best images in this review were produced on a D200 with its 10.2 DX sensor. And this image, which can be printed perfectly happily at print sizes bigger than A3, was produced on a D70S with its 6.1 megapixel DX sensor. Clearly, the common factor providing the high quality in all these images is the 70-200 f2.8 lens. Having also used this lens on a D800 body, I can confirm that unsurprisingly, its quality is more than up to the challenge of a megapixel count in the upper 30s. And whilst comparing camera bodies, it's worth pointing out that although this is a full-frame FX lens, it works extremely well on DX bodies too. The crop sensor gives it an effective focal length of 105 to 300 mm which at f2.8 is a fairly unbeatable package. Given the highly complex construction of this zoom lens, you might expect the bokeh, or the appearance of the outer focus areas, to be rather disappointing. However, the 70-200 once again turns in a performance comparable with many prime lenses. The bokeh is generally smooth and very natural, making this a very usable lens for portrait work, and only very occasionally takes on a rather swirly appearance. As I'm sure you're starting to see, this is a lens with which it's very hard to find any faults. Pretty much the only area where one might have the faintest chance of putting a question mark over this lens's performance is in the very corners of the frame as the focal length climbs up towards 200mm. It's certainly the case that if you zoom in on a distant object at 200mm, with a blank area like a clear sky as the background, then you definitely do see some darkening in the corners as you look through the viewfinder. However, after many years of noting this effect, I can confirm that this darkening is almost never transferred to the actual pictures. My best guess is it must be some interaction between the optics of the lens and the viewfinder system of the camera, since this darkening is definitely visible through the viewfinder, but never seems to be transferred to the final image. If you're really determined, it is possible to forcibly take pictures which show some kind of darkening or softening at the edges at 200mm. But to put this point to rest, I've spent a very boring few hours flicking through over a decade's worth of images taken at around 200mm, but I simply couldn't find a single real-life image that suffered noticeably from this effect. There's really no two ways about it, the optical performance of this lens is outstanding. If you want a fast, high-quality lens in the 70-200mm focal length range, then the f2.8 zoom could well be the only lens that you'll ever need. Nevertheless, Nikon do produce some spectacular prime lenses in this focal length range, and so in this section we have a quick review of the current lineup. The selection of lenses which Nikon offer in this focal length range is rather unusual. 
If you just want an ordinary f2.8 prime lens in this focal length range, then with one exception, you're largely out of luck. Almost all the lenses which Nikon offer in this focal length range come with macro facility defocus control or the extremely fast f1.4 aperture. Consequently, it's quite hard to find direct alternatives to the ordinary 70-200 f2.8 zoom. Nevertheless, if you need to do macro or portraiture work, or need a lens with an extremely fast aperture, then you may well find something of interest in this selection. The wider end of this focal length range is overshadowed by Nikon's legendary 85mm lenses. These lenses provide an ideal focal length for portrait work, combined with an extremely fast f1.8 or f1.4 aperture to help with isolation of the subject. The current AFS f1.4 version provides an almost unique combination of extreme sharpness at all apertures with wonderfully smooth and natural out of focus regions or bokeh. Although the 70 200 does a good job in these areas, the 85 f1.4 is one of the best lenses around in terms of isolating subjects from the background, and therefore remains something of a legend for portrait work. Although the current AFS version doesn't have the tank like build quality of the former all metal AFD version, it provides lightning fast autofocus and some of the best optical quality that money can buy. Not surprisingly then, it's about three quarters the cost of a brand new 70-200 VR2 lens. The best value for money at this focal length may well be the f1.8 version. Costing less than a quarter the price of a brand new 70-200 VR2, it offers a very similar but slightly slower optical package. If you're convinced that you need the full f1.4 experience, then the full metal AFD version is still available second hand. Because of their build quality, these lenses tend to last very well, but also to retain a fairly high price tag. For a good quality used version, you may have to pay nearly half the cost of a brand new AFS version. However, they do provide you with much the same dreamy bokeh as the current AFS lens, albeit without quite the same astonishing sharpness at all apertures of the latest lens. At 105mm, there is currently no simple f2.8 prime lens. The focal length is entirely populated by special interest, defocus and macro lenses. At the f2.8 aperture we have Nikon's 105mm AFS macro lens, which represents the middle of Nikon's three macro prime lenses at 60mm, 105 and 200mm. Replacing the long-standing AFD version in 2006, this lens will focus all the way from infinity down to a distance of just over 30cm and give a true one-to-one -one macro reproduction without the use of any additional extension tubes. As you'd expect from something with micro Nikkor written on the side, this lens delivers extremely sharp images whether you're working at macro distances or with more conventional subjects. Despite its complicated close focusing design, autofocus speed and bokeh are both good, making it an effective if rather chunky alternative for ordinary mid-telephoto work. My only two slight grumbles are the fact that the autofocus system isn't quite as sure-footed as the 70-200 f2.8 zoom, and that the image in the viewfinder breathes quite noticeably during focusing. This means that the image produced by the lens changes in size quite considerably during the focusing process. Consequently, if you frame your shot before focusing, you could find that once the autofocus has done its job, important parts of it are now outside the frame. This could be quite irritating in a zoom lens, but in a prime lens where you have to zoom with your feet, I often find this really very annoying. As a macro lens at this focal length, this lens is pretty much unbeatable, but for non-macro subjects there are other lenses which are much easier in use. One of these is the 105mm f2 defocus control lens. Although the headline with this lens is Nikon's defocus control, let's first of all look at its optical properties and then consider the defocusing as an additional feature afterwards. The first thing that hits you with this 105mm f2 lens is its build quality. It's built almost entirely from metal, with the barrel of the lens finished with Nikon's incredibly tough crinkle finish. All the controls are finished to an extremely high standard and the lens is an absolute delight to use. Although switching between auto and manual focus is by means of an old-fashioned switch and the lens is focused mechanically, the actual speed of auto-focusing is extremely fast. Optically, this is one of Nikon's highest performing lenses, with extremely high standards of clarity and saturation and levels of sharpness comparable with Nikon's macro lenses. Its fast f2 aperture allows it to deliver extremely high levels of subject isolation, as in this example where the background wall is only about a foot and a half behind the object being photographed. This lens also delivers some of the smoothest and most natural looking out of focus areas of any Nikon lens. This unparalleled level of bokeh has given this lens something of a cult following amongst fashion and portrait photographers. In addition to these stunning optical qualities, this lens also has Nikon's unique defocus control. Despite its rather confusing name, as you can see from the sample images, this has absolutely nothing to do with softening the focus of the lens. Instead, turning the defocus control near the front of the lens allows you to increase the level of blur in the out-of-focus regions of the image. 
As you can see, the control can be used to increase the level of blur in the areas behind the object in focus or in front of it. Although in practice it's more usual to want to increase the level of blur in a background than to emphasise distracting out of focus areas in front of the object. As an example, here's our sample object again, but this time photographed at f5.6. As you can see, compared to f2, the depth of field is obviously much bigger and the background is much less out of focus. Nevertheless, the lens's wonderfully smooth and natural bokeh is still evident. If we now rotate the defocus control in the rear section, we'll increase the level of blur in the areas behind the object in focus, thus increasing the level of subject isolation. In other words, while shooting at f5.6, you can use the defocus control to give you a level of subject isolation and background blur, equivalent to that of a wider aperture. This is obviously a lens which could cheerfully fill a video on its own, and so our final statistic for this spectacular piece of optical and mechanical design is unfortunately the price. A new 105 f2 DC lens weighs in at about half the price of a 70-200 VR2 lens. Moving up to the classic telephoto focal length of 135mm, we find only one lens in the current Nikon catalogue, the 135mm f2 defocus control lens, which is basically the larger brother of the 105mm lens that we just looked at. It offers the same outstanding optical quality, but at a slightly longer focal length. In terms of our lineup of alternatives, this really didn't seem quite right, as Nikon have been producing outstanding 135mm lenses for many decades now. And indeed, if you're prepared to step back into the dark ages before AFD was invented, there are a large number of 135mm f2.8 manual lenses by Nikon. The one on show here is a 135mm f2.8 AI lens from the late 1970s. The first thing to notice, and the reason why this lens deserves a place in our list of alternatives, can be seen by looking at some of the sample images. With subjects that aren't moving around too much, the optical quality is very comparable with the 70-200 f2.8 lens of today. The images have that wonderful clarity which has been a feature of Nikon Prime lenses long before the invention of autofocus. This is hardly surprising when you consider that this lens contains only five pieces of glass, as opposed to the 20 odd of modern mega zoom lenses. In low light, the quality of colour saturation holds up particularly well, in my view slightly better than many modern zoom lenses. The clear message here is that when Nikon added autofocus to their range of lenses, this really didn't represent any major leap forward in optical quality and so we shouldn't really be surprised to see this high level of optical performance from pre-AF lenses. In addition, as there was no need to strap autofocus machinery around these lenses, they're inevitably considerably smaller than their modern autofocus counterparts. The build quality of this lens would be rated as outstanding by modern standards. It's made almost entirely out of metal and finished to an extremely high standard. These lenses were clearly designed to last a lifetime, as you can see from this example, which has weathered nearly 40 years of service and is still an absolute delight to use. Using a manual Nikon lens like this with a modern computer-packed DSLR body is relatively straightforward. There are just a couple of things that need to be borne in mind. Firstly, it's best to stick to AI or AIS lenses. These were the last two generations of Nikon manual lenses and date back to around the late 1970s. Although it's not impossible to use earlier versions of Nikon manual lenses, you'll need to check very carefully the technical specifications of the lens against the camera body that you intend to use it with and there's a good chance that you'll find it won't work as smoothly with modern bodies as the AI and the AIS lenses do. With my two camera bodies, the D3S and the D7000, it's simply a matter of entering the focal length and the maximum aperture into the camera before using the lens in exactly the same way it would have been used in the days of film photography. You'll need to go to the non-CPU lens data item in the setup menu and enter the manual lens's focal length and maximum aperture and then press OK. After that, the lens should work fine, and the only difference you'll notice is that you have to turn the focusing ring in order to focus the lens. In use, AI and AIS lenses like this retain their fully automatic diaphragm, which means that the lens stays at maximum aperture while you focus and compose the picture, and only stops down to the aperture which you've set for the instant of exposure. Although setting the aperture can now only be done by rotating the ring around the lens barrel, you do get a full reading of the value that you've set on the camera's LCD screen. On my two camera bodies, all the metering modes appear to work perfectly. The obvious huge difference is the fact that the camera can't autofocus the lens. Although on several occasions I've forgotten this and have been tapping angrily away at the shutter button expecting something to happen. Nevertheless, the autofocus sensors inside the camera body still work in the usual way. This means you'll still get the circle confirming correct focus and the helpful little triangles pointing you in the right direction in the viewfinder. And you can also change which focus point you're using using the controls on the camera body. In use, this means that although focusing is no longer instantaneous, you can get exactly the same accuracy of focusing as you would with an autofocus lens. Clearly, for some subjects, the lack of AF would completely rule out lenses like this. And if you photograph subjects where the lightning-fast reactions of modern autofocus are absolutely essential, 
then feel free to ignore the last few minutes of this video. However, if the subjects that you photograph don't move around too much, or they move very predictably making pre-focusing possible, then a manual lens such as this one can offer you optical quality very much comparable with the 70-200 f2.8 zoom. And of course the absolutely massive elephant in the room which I haven't mentioned yet is the price. The obviously used 135mm f2.8 lens that you see here cost about a tenth of the price of a modern 70-200 f2.8 zoom. If you want to shoot in the 70-200mm range and can work around the lack of a zoom and autofocus, then a lens like this can provide you with highly comparable optical quality for a budget in the hundreds rather than the thousands. Although my example here is the 135mm, you can find a similar story at the other classic focal lengths in this range, such as 85, 105, 180 and 200. My only final caveat would be that if you're looking at an AI or an AIS manual lens, you could be looking at a lens that's done many decades of active service. For this reason you need to take particular care when purchasing. If you're not able to inspect the lens before you buy, then make sure that you're buying from a reputable dealer or that there'll be no problem with returning the lens if you're not satisfied with it. At 180mm we find the only ordinary f2.8 prime lens in this range. The 180mm f2.8 AFD lens has the same all-metal legendary build quality of the 105 and 135 DC lenses, along with similarly awesome optical quality. It produces images with the clarity and saturation that Nikon professional prime lenses have become famous for. Levels of distortion are practically non-existent and it produces wonderfully smooth and natural bokeh. Although it's an AFD lens, its autofocus speed is very fast, although it can't match the near instantaneous speeds of the 70-200 zoom. Although this is obviously not a zoom lens, if you need to shoot at the upper end of the 70-200mm range, then this lens is smaller and lighter, offers similar build quality and slightly better optical performance at about half the price of the 70-200 f2.8 zoom. Nikon offer two prime lenses at the 200mm focal length. The 200mm f4 micro Nikkor is the longest of Nikon's three macro lenses. As with all of Nikon's three macro lenses, the image quality is pretty much hard to beat. In particular, levels of sharpness with this lens are about the best that money can buy. However, this lens is also a good example of the inverse relationship between sharpness and quality of bokeh. In other words, as one goes up, the other goes down. Only a few lenses, such as Nikon's 85mm, are able to buck this trend, and the 200mm isn't one of them. The price you pay for insane levels of sharpness is rather uninspiring bokeh. However, this may not matter very much as this lens is capable of getting pictures which other lenses simply couldn't take. Focusing all the way down to a 1 to 1 life size reproduction ratio, without the need for any special attachments and with a relatively large working distance, this lens has become something of an industry standard for those photographing plants, small creatures and other creepy crawlies. Once again in this range, this lens is more of a specialist tool and is not really designed to be much of a replacement for the 70-200 zoom. Finally, if you need to shoot at the top end of the 70-200mm range, with absolutely the last word in light grasp and subject isolation, then Nikon have the 200mm f2 lens. Its cardboard tube in this picture doesn't really do it justice, as it's more than half as thick again as the 70-200 f2.8 zoom lens. It offers spectacular prime lens optical quality and lightning fast autofocus speed, albeit in a rather chunky package. If you need the last word in pretty much everything at the 200mm focal length, then this lens could well be for you. However, as you can probably imagine, this kind of quality doesn't come cheap, and this lens retails for nearly two and a half times the cost of a brand new 70-200 f2.8. Our random walk through the prime lenses in this range has shown us what a perfect combination of specification, performance and features the 70-200 f2.8 zoom lens really is. In fact, if you're shooting in the 70-200mm range, there's really only three reasons why you'd ever consider buying anything other than this lens. If you need an extremely fast, rather than just a fast aperture, if you need true macro ability, or if you need the very highest levels of bokeh or bokeh control, then there are prime lenses which will do a better job than this lens. Other than those three exceptions, the 70-200 f2.8 zoom would come top of the list for pretty much any other photographic assignment. Consequently, the only real question left with this lens is to look at the various price levels which are available. Obviously top of the list is the latest VR2 version of this lens. Although an incredible package as we've seen, this lens still costs a very large amount of money. A second option might therefore be a second-hand example of the original VR1 version of this lens. Although this lens has slightly slower autofocus speed, and its VR system only allows three extra stops of hand-holding speed as opposed to four with the VR2 system, I've always struggled to notice any real difference in optical quality. And the good news is that the existence of the VR2 version has helped to push down the second-hand price of the VR1 lenses, to about three quarters that of a brand new VR2 lens. Finally, there's a very attractive third way at about half the price of a brand new VR2 lens, which is the 70-200 f4. 
Again, this is another well-judged package from Nikon, as losing the high light grasp of an f2.8 aperture is less of an issue nowadays in the world of high ISO digital SLR bodies than it would have been back in the day of film photography. Further savings have been made in another couple of areas which may only be of interest to professional photographers. The AF speed is slightly slower, and there's much more plastic used in its construction than the all-metal f2.8. Nevertheless, it's very clear which stable this lens comes from, as it shares a great deal of its optical quality with the f2.8 lenses. There's slightly more distortion, and its bokeh is slightly less lovely, but for a price that's half the cost of the f2.8 lens, this lens represents fantastic value for money, and represents an excellent way of enjoying much of the optical quality we've seen in this video, at only half the cost. Speaking personally, and given the mix of features I need for the kind of pictures I take, I think a good second-hand VR1 lens represents the best value for money from these three. However, it's certainly the case if you buy any one of these three lenses, you're certainly not going to be disappointed. Before leaving this section, we obviously need to have a look at alternative zoom lenses. Nikon have made an awful lot of medium telephoto zoom lenses over the years, and it's certainly not going to be possible to look at each one individually. However, if the high cost of the 70-200 f2.8 zoom is causing problems, then there are certainly a couple of lenses which is worth having a quick look at. The first of these is the very much overlooked 80-200 f2.8 lens. Although this lens doesn't look anything like as sexy as the 70-200 f2.8, it has similar build quality, highly comparable optical quality, and respectably fast autofocus speed. When you consider the fact that second-hand versions of this lens can be found down towards a third the cost of a 70-200 VR2 lens, I'm often surprised this lens doesn't get more attention. It allows you to shoot at the full f2.8 aperture with very respectable optical quality and at a very much reduced price compared to the 70-200. As you can see, this lens has had a complicated history and care needs to be taken when purchasing, particularly on the second-hand market. The original autofocus version of this lens was produced as a single ring zoom lens. This means the lens had only one large twistable ring on it. This was twisted as normal for focusing, but was slid in and out trombone style for zooming. Although these single ring versions of this lens had good optical quality, their autofocus speed was notoriously slow, and these lenses are probably best avoided. The conversion to a conventional two ring design, which came after the upgrade to AFD technology, resulted in a considerable improvement in autofocus speed. The final AFS version maintains the strong optical quality with a further slight improvement to autofocus speed. Both the AFD and the AFS two ring design will provide you with an excellent f2.8 telephoto zoom at a very reasonable price indeed. And if you're buying the AFD version, make very sure you're getting the later two ring version rather than the earlier one ring design. Finally, a very quick mention is warranted for the 70 to 210 f4 to 5.6 lens. If your budget is in the tens rather than the hundreds, then this lens offers surprisingly good optical quality, albeit with almost none of the whizzy features of the 70-200 f2.8 zoom. With its mechanical autofocus and its maximum aperture heading down towards f5.6, its specification certainly looks very pedestrian by comparison. However, when mounted on a D3S and a tripod, and shooting a stone wall at f8 in good light, it's really clear there's absolutely nothing wrong with the glass inside this lens. When zoomed out to 200mm, its maximum aperture of f5.6 could be a real handicap back in the day of film photography. If you were shooting handheld with, for example, 200 ISO film on board and the light levels started to fail, then you could quickly find that you were shooting at very slow shutter speeds, with very disappointing results indeed. However, the quality of modern DSLR cameras when set to high ISO figures effectively gives this lens a new lease of life. When you can cheerfully set ISO figures up into the thousands, the f5.6 aperture is nothing like the handicap that it used to be. This lens is never going to be a great isolator of subjects, but on a modern DSLR body, can produce very acceptable results. Incidentally, if you do go looking for one of these lenses second-hand, make sure to get the AFD, not the earlier AFN version. The one shown here is an AFN version, you can tell this because it simply says AF on the lens barrel, and because it has agriculturally slow autofocus speed. The AFD lens will have a D on the lens barrel, and an autofocus speed which is at least respectable by modern standards. These lenses are obviously well made, as there's a fair number of them available on the second-hand market. They generally sell for about a twentieth the cost of a 70-200 f2.8 zoom, or less than the cost of a decent Nikon polarising filter. If you're working on the very strictest of budgets, then these lenses offer optical quality way beyond what you'd expect from their price. This lens is clearly an example of Nikon lenses at their very best, and so the conclusion to this review is extremely simple. If you intend to take any photographs at a focal length longer than 50mm at any point in your photographic career, then simply buy this lens. With the possible exception of a few specialist niches, nothing else comes close. In fact, if you don't actually own a Nikon camera, I suggest you sell all your photographic gear and buy a Nikon camera, simply so that you can use this lens. 
A good test for any lens would be to compare the number of photographs which it's got for you which you couldn't have taken with any other lens against its cost. Thinking back over the past decade or so of owning this lens, on this system the lens would score an easy 11 out of 10, even considering its very high price. Thanks very much for staying on through to the finishing line and I hope you found something useful in this video. Your comments, whether you agree or disagree, are always very welcome, so please type them in at the box below. And I'm trying to keep a regular stream of Nikon lens reviews coming, so please subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.